And because of the aggressive process, that oil is typically exposed. So it will oxidize and you're getting the opposite effect then. You're getting a much lower shelf life product. So when I started the Less Stress Life podcast in 2017, it was kind of an accident. I wanted to collect and connect people to information that helped make life better. But I picked the title Less Stress Life because it was when I was doing more Facebook Live videos and when I talked about inflammation, only people that knew what inflammation was tuned in. So I wanted a broader term and that's how we landed on stress, which is really a synonym for all the good and bad inflammation in life. In 2019, we went to weekly episodes and got a great response. And I just want to say thank you for being here and for listening. This podcast is one of the best parts of my week. And because of you, we get to keep putting it out there. We have a lot of exciting stuff planned in 2020, and I'll be sharing more about that in the new year. But first, and before we get to this week's show, I asked listeners last month to submit their favorite holiday traditions. And here were some of their responses. My name is Emily. This is Britt. My name is Brianne. This is Sandy. This is Scott Stuckel. My favorite Christmas pastime is um, singing Christmas carols with my family. My favorite Christmas pastime is singing at the midnight service at the cathedral. We sing Christmas carols and we also dance around the Christmas tree in a big circle to traditional Swedish Christmas songs. My favorite Christmas pastime would be going to midnight mass with my family and then afterwards getting together and just playing a few card games or any kind of games and just hanging out with family. My favorite part about the holidays is the turkey. And we decorate our Christmas tree, usually the Sunday after Thanksgiving because it's a long holiday, home from school. When we were younger, we would all go to my grandma and grandpa's house every um, year for Christmas. And we'd all be crammed in the living room um, after we'd eat open presents and eat in the big Christmas dinner. And my grandma would get on the piano and she would play some Christmas carols and we'd all sing along. Kind of enjoy the turkey and seeing all the family together and setting up the Christmas tree that Sunday after Thanksgiving. It's kind of a family tradition we've done and my kids and I really enjoy it. We also have the uh, Swedish version of Santa, which is called a tumta. And the Tumta comes dressed to the house and brings gifts for the kids. I am so excited for Christmas this year. Merry Christmas. So there you have it. Those are the less stressed life favorite holiday traditions from listeners. Also, thank you to Scott who submitted his holiday tradition and won the recent giveaway last month. You can submit questions anytime on the speak pipe widget or app over at lessstressedlife.com. Okay, today on The Less Stressed Life, we are talking about flax, and we are going to talk about flax, why it's important, how we use it in practice with different health conditions, like very functionally, but we brought in someone who knows a lot about flax because she grew up around it her entire life. Her name is Mary Ekman, and she's one of three sisters that is in the family, the Pizzi family that has been, uh, they've been flax farmers forever, for many, many generations in Manitoba, Canada. So Mary and her sisters are the second generation in their family's million business. So um, they've had the family farm for a long time, but long story short, Mary's parents, Glenn and Linda, were really interested in the health benefits of flaxseed in the 80s. And so Linda began baking flax bread and selling it at farmer's markets and using ground flaxseed. Um, and so from that, eventually this turned into a company known as Pizzi's Milling, which supplies flaxseed to food and pet food manufacturers throughout North America. And you may or may not have seen some of their products uh, labeled as Manitoba Milling. I know I've had them. I have them in my kitchen. I've been using them a lot for recipe testing just lately. So Mary and her sisters are really behind that milling company. And she's going to chat with us um, about some uses for flax today. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. So I really also love flax and I would love to paint a picture here for the listeners. I live in farm country and, um, we don't, uh, have flax right here where I live like around right. I can't see flax from my house, but I used to work with a nurse whose family did organic flax farming and they actually exported most of it to Brazil, which would be kind of interesting to talk about, um, the uses, like how much is used in the U.S. and and whatnot, because I think it's just sort of interesting to know that background. People don't usually know that stuff. But just to paint a picture, flax is gorgeous. Um, It's these blue flowered fields that just look like a sea of 
beauty uh, when they're blooming. Um, is that how you picture it as well? Or is that how, like, what was that like growing up around so much of it, I guess? Because I've seen such, like, there's only a few fields like this around me and they're just breathtaking. Yes, absolutely. That That's one of its uh, signature trademarks um, on the Canadian prairies. You can, and I think growing up around it, you kind of just take it for granted, quite frankly. <laughs> Um, I live in the, in the part, in a part of the U S where I no longer see flaxseed either. And it's not until I've moved away that I've, I've really noticed, um, just how, how beautiful it really is. It, it truly looks like a lake, um, in the, you know, late June, early July through early August when it, when it starts to, um, become ready for harvest, but it, it really looks like a, a blue lake and it's, it's beautiful. So if you've ever traveled across the Canadian prairies and, and seen it, you will definitely know there's, there's no mistaking it. Yeah. So, I mean, your family is obviously still into the farming of flax and how common is this? So it's really common in Canada, the way you make it sound. Um, it's very, so what conditions have to be present for flax to grow and thrive? How common is it? What, what percentage of your farming market is it? It's sort of interesting to just kind of realize where your food is coming from and where it's, um, where it's commonly grown. It's, it's certainly, um, much more common on the Canadian prairies and even in, in North Dakota and some in Montana than it is in any other states in the U S. Um, but it's becoming, you know, more of a minor crop as well for, for Canadians. Uh, unfortunately I, I have noticed a little bit of a decrease in, in the amount of acres that have been growing over the years, but that all said, we still use such a small percentage uh, for human nutrition. Most of the flaxseed that's grown still goes into what we call uh, more industrial purposes. So it's crushed for its oil, which goes into paint. Um, and that that's still the majority um, of the usage of flaxseed is into industrial purposes for, for paint or for flooring. L- linoleum is, they, they use flax oil in linoleum as well. And so we still use, I would say, maybe 15% of the total flaxseed grown in Canada is used for either human food or beverage or even pet food manufacturing. So we still use such a small amount of it that even though the acres have been going down a a little bit, we, we still have a huge portion to draw from most of the time for, for, for human food. Yeah. It's really interesting to see. Um, I bet we could say that for a lot of other crops um, or grains, but it's weird for probably people to hear that because we don't think, we think about flax as being such an edible, right? And so um, it, you just think that more of it would be used for human consumption. And I know some of it actually goes to pet food as well, correct? Yes. A large volume goes into pet food. In, in fact, most, most major or most dog foods on the market, I would say mid to high quality dog foods have flaxseed in them. So I, I would also say that the pet food industry has been a little bit further ahead than the human nutrition um, market for, for realizing its benefits and for putting it into uh, anim- or, or pet food products. Right. Um, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation, isn't it? About, um, about just the market that is animal nutrition and especially yep. pet nutrition. So, so. Right. Um, let's talk about it in terms of we're all humans listening to this. So we'll talk about this in human terms, <laughs> um, going forward. So, uh, I use flax a lot in nutrition practice because, um, it's, it's traditionally been talked about for its fiber and lignans, but specifically when we're dealing with hormonal issues, people have sometimes high estrogen and that can look like, uh, strong periods, heavy periods, um, painful, uh, painful menstrual cramps. And flax is a wonderful functional food to take at high doses to improve how that works. So basically the lignans can, to, can kind of bind onto estrogen, and help take the excess out of the body. Um, and so you can get some symptom relief, but when we're doing that, we recommend a lot. Um, and so I want you to kind of talk to us about some really unique ways to use flax. Um, but before we do that, so let's talk about the fatty acid properties as well, because flax is, um, alpha linoleic acid. So it's an omega-3 fatty acid like chia seeds, but our body doesn't really efficiently process that particular omega-3 into the type, like our body should process it into a usable DHA and EPA format. And we're actually going to talk a ton about that um, coming up in a few weeks on the podcast. We're talking about different types of omega-3s and specifically their health benefits. But um, the reason I really like uh, flax is because 
uh, I use it very commonly to, this is hard to describe, but basically to get nutrients inside cells, they have to have these beautiful cell membranes and flax oil does a really nice job improving that nice cell membrane. I always use, this is like not a great analogy, but like a lawn with really dry soil, if the cell membrane is like cracked and not very, it doesn't have these nice fatty acid, um, component to its structure, you're not going to get like a grass seed inside of it, right? If it's like nice and moist and whatnot, and if it's beautiful cell, like beautiful fatty acid profile, you're going to allow certain nutrients to get into the cell a little bit easier. So that's a weird thing that I'm using flax for a lot in practice. It seems to work really, really well. Um, but Mary, why don't you tell me like you grew up with this? Do you see like, what has been your interpretation of health benefits in flax? Um, in your own life and family. And then as you kind of look out at the general landscape over the years. Yeah. So first and foremost, um, the omega three was really what it first became known for where people, you know, were initially very excited about and and they, they still are for sure. And that, that whole discussion around ALA versus, um, EPA and DHA is a really interesting one. And maybe we can circle back on that at a later date, but I'd love to share more with you about the benefits of ALA omega-3 from flaxseed versus DHA and EPA, which are more commonly found in fish or LJ or, or more of the uh, marine sources. We, we have found that ALA on its own has benefits that EPA and DHA also do not have. Um, the, the other thing to point out is that the human body is very smart. It's or, or very capable, maybe is a better term. It will convert ALA into EPA and DHA. Now, there's been a lot of debate around, okay, does it convert enough? Um, are you still getting the amount of DHA and EPA that your body needs? And so that's a whole other discussion topic. But the the main point that we've learned is that ALA does not need to convert to EPA and DHA, although it it does, and your body will convert as much as it feels that it needs. Um, And there's many variables that play into that, but it will convert as much as it it needs in order to get benefit from it. So that's a whole other discussion maybe that we we can um, take up down the road, but I, I think it's very interesting. The, well, the FD- flax has so many other benefits beyond right. omega threes, right? So that's what you're exactly. about to tell us about. Yeah. Yeah. So ALA is one of them. The other thing is is the lignans, which you you've already mentioned. That's a very um, we feel still an untapped um, benefit of flaxseed that many people still are not aware of is the, the uh, lignans, which they they're a, a plant based estrogen. They act like estrogen in your body, and there's a a whole ton of research that's been done, um, primarily around breast cancer, prostate cancer, more of the hormone sensitive cancers in, in both women and men, where lignans have shown just outstanding benefits. But then again, the other thing that flaxseed is very high in is fiber. So there's another, you know, there's a number of nutritional properties of flaxseed we don't always know where the full benefit is coming from. You know, people take it for a number of different reasons, um, cardiovascular health, um, cholesterol lowering, all kinds of areas. And it, it's hard to pinpoint, is, is the benefit coming from the ALA? Is it coming from lignans? Is it coming from fiber or a combination of all of those things? Yeah. So there's just a ton of benefits to flaxseed and it's, we're still working on narrowing down exactly where the benefit's coming from. And that's the beauty of nature, right? It's the whole plant and the synergy of it, that it all works really together to, to infer a really great health benefit. Right, exactly. So, and that's the key, you know, many people have taken flax oil capsules, which those contain the omega-3. So that's good. But what you're missing then is the fiber and the lignans and flax also has protein. So we've always been big proponents of using the the whole seed and the other um portion of flaxseed that that is out there in the marketplace is called flaxseed meal and there is a difference flaxseed meal typically refers to the byproduct of oil pressing and many people don't know that so the downside to flaxseed meal is that it only contains the fiber and the protein the the oil has been, and, and the lignans the the oil has been pressed out of it so that's the other thing um, to be very aware of. You you really want the, the whole seed, the whole milled flaxseed. 
I haven't seen flax meal on the shelf that I'm aware of, but I imagine they would press out the oil because it makes it more shelf stable longer. Would that be correct? Oil is typically exposed, so it will oxidize and you're getting the opposite effect then. You're getting a much lower shelf life product. So what is that used for? Well, there is quite a bit of it on the store shelves, unfortunately. Um, other, other parts of it will go into animal feed or pet food, but very little actually can be used in pet food because of the, the uh, sensory um, ability of, of dogs, for example. They, they know when, when their food is oxidized. So mm-hmm. getting back to the pet food discussion just very briefly, there's actually some higher standards for pet food than there is even for human food, which is quite shocking in, in some ways. But dogs will not eat anything that's oxidized. So they're very, very tight um, with that. Um, so you, you've got to be very careful with with any byproducts, but you know, with flaxseed uh, pressed seed, you're actually ending up with a product that is much less stable. So is it possible that this is being labeled on the shelf as ground flax, but it's flax meal? Is that correct? It is possible. Okay. It is possible. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you guys with Manitoba milling have um, an interesting set of products. You have flax milk and you have specific milled flaxseed. Let's talk about the appropriate ways to consume flaxseed for the ultimate health benefit and why this milled flaxseed. So your flaxseed, your ground milled flaxseed is different, fluffier, very, very unique compared to any other flaxseed I've ever touched or used before. So let's talk about that. Yeah. It, so it's, it's just very, very finely milled to put it very simply that that is, there's really no mystique behind it other than it's just a very finely milled product. So the um, other more common ground flax seeds that are out there are just coarser ground. So there's more hull um, still intact versus our, our product. Everything is still there, but it's, it's just very, very finely milled. So it's a much slower process. It takes us longer to do that. But we just feel like it's a little bit more palatable for people. It's a little bit more universal. Um, you can use it for many other things that maybe you couldn't use just, um, just the uh, regular, coarse, more coarsely ground product for. So it is velvety smooth. You can put it into a smoothie. You can put it, I just put mine in yogurt. I know m- many people do that just because it's easy. And um, you can certainly notice it's there, but it has, it, it just helps with the mouthfeel pretty, pr- pretty significantly. So it's just been more universal for people. We also put our, our product through a pasteurization process. That's for food safety. They're, Flaxseed is not inherently risky from a food safety perspective. However, it is a just a raw agricultural product and anything can happen. So we do it, number one, for food safety. And then number two, there's also some flavor development that happens during that heating process. And people um, hear pasteurization and think that that's a real, you know, you're more familiar maybe with dairy pasteurization or or, or juice pasteurization. Our process is very, very slow. So you're still getting the effect, but the, this, the, it it just takes much longer. So you get really nice flavor development as well, which takes, takes away a little bit of that more grainy, um, sharp taste that some people have been known to notice with, with flaxseed. I have a weird question about, uh, I've been using your flax a lot to make um, an egg substitute as I'm testing different yes. recipes without eggs. And you basically just mix a little water with milled flaxseed. It works really, really, really well with your flaxseed. Um, this doesn't, this is not a question particular necessarily to your flaxseed, but it's something I've noticed with certain flax products. And I think it has to do with oxidation. And as I was doing some recipe development recently with like a flax and chia seed cracker, there was a lot of discussion in some recipe comments about a fishy smell. Now there's no fish mm-hmm. there. And sometimes it'll let, let off like an egg. I literally, my five-year-old said, why does this smell like eggs? There are no eggs in this. (laughs) Um, And so is that an essence that the flax is giving off? Because it seems to be like, is there something going on there? Do you know what I'm talking about? I I do. And yes, if you notice a fishy smell, that is an oxidation problem. And that's one of the quickest ways you can tell. Mm -hmm. If you notice a fishy smell, you, yeah, you've definitely, that's an indication of oxidated product. So whether it's flax or chia or whatever it is you're working with, it is a very common occurrence with flaxseed that has not been processed correctly. Right. And this could happen because for the listeners, oxidation is when the oil 
oxidizes and so it rancid it makes the product rancid and this is why it makes a lot of sense if you buy something in a large quantity to store it in the freezer and to store a small container of it in your cupboard because then it's its shelf life is kept much longer in the freezer but what about the egg smell am i like just uh making that up or is there do you ever catch that <laughs> That, that's a brand new one. I have never heard that before. All right, no, cool. I'm not sure. We'll retry all this and see if we okay. get the same results. Good. Um, okay, so you've got this special milled flaxseed, and I want to talk about I want to talk about some ways to use it. But you guys also have a milk, which that's not something we see a lot on the shelf either. I don't feel like you can find flax milk very readily. Why is that? It is brand new. It is absolutely brand new. We are just launching it now. We've launched it across Canada. It's it, it will be in most major centers in Canada within the next couple of weeks um, and down here within the first of the year. So we're, we're a small company. It, it's, it's taken some time, but it's out there. It is on Amazon right now. It's a little bit cumbersome to purchase a perishable product on Amazon, but it, 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 it is available there as well. Um, but to, C- coming soon to a grocery store near you, I, I guess is what I'd say. <laughs> yeah. So the reason that we don't see a lot of flax milk on the shelf, is it because it has to be like, we can't make that. It's not common to see that sh- be um, shelf stable. I only see it in the refrigerated section. Is that correct? Actually, no. Um, we, we have the ability to go shelf stable as well. It, again, it, it goes back to seed quality, and that's really what we've built our products on is is good quality flaxseed and our milling process. So there's a got there's a, a a lot of good flaxseed products out there. There's also a lot of I would say subpar, unfortunately. Sure. So um, it's definitely very very doable to have a shelf stable flaxseed product. We just chosen to go in the refrigerated section because we feel like that's the, the, the uh, part of the grocery store that we'd rather be in. So it's been more of a, just a company choice in, in that regard. What goes into a higher quality flaxseed other than how long it's been sitting? Actually, the most important um, aspect of good quality flaxseed is how it's grown. So if, if, if it's deficient, if in the, the growing season, if there's been any type of stress on the plant during the growing season, it doesn't matter what you do to it afterwards. It's not, it's, it's going to oxidize. So going back to, um, you know, putting flaxseed in the freezer, that actually also will not help. Um, if it's oxidized, it's oxidized. So it goes right back to the field. And that's the benefit we have as farmers. We've, we've, We've grown flaxseed, well, I certainly haven't, but my family's grown it for over 100 years in Manitoba. So we've learned a lot ab- about it. Um, and if it's not taken care of, if the, if the soil is, is also malnourished, um, to put it one way, the, the seed is not going to be quality um, product and you may as well stop right there. So that's number one. Number two, again, goes back to the milling process. So you want to make sure that when you're milling it, the oil stays still bound in, in the seed matrix so that it's not open to oxidation. And those are the two primary things that you have to watch. Refrigerating it, um, putting it in an in a airtight container actually will not help that. The, 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 the second you open the container, it will oxidize. So unfortunately, that's just the way it is. You have to start with good quality seed and then you have to mill it properly or you're going to have a problem. Okay. So at no stage, you would say that storing it in the freezer is useful, even if it's like fresh out of the field, it doesn't preserve it any longer because you're saying it starts. Okay. So it starts with good seed. And so, um, I'm assuming you don't plant flax in the same fields year after year because that would create a malnourished plant. So what other, what other crops do you have in rotation? And the reason you would rotate is to take care of the soil. So there's different nutrients being pulled from the soil. And then some people put cover crops in to replenish or put soil, put nutrients back into the soil. So do you use any of those in your farming? Yeah, we, we actually rotate all the time. So, um, I think that if, let's see, I think there's like a three-year rotation. So if flaxseed is grown one year, we would be either growing wheat or canola or barley. Um, in the other years. And then we would go back to flax for that very reason that you mentioned. It depletes the soil if, if you grow the same thing over and over again. So we really, really watch um, our soil nu- nutrition to make sure that we're not depleting it and we're taking care of it so that it can give us healthy plants. That kind of seems like a very simplistic 
elementary way to describe it, but that's, that's really what it is. Right. Yeah. And it's a, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it obviously makes a huge difference in the product quality. So you're saying that a lot of flaxseed may, flaxseed may arrive to the shelf already oxidized or yeah. as a subpar product. Exactly. Unfortunately, that is the case. Yep. Got it. All right. So let's talk about, I was talking earlier about making significant recommendations, a quarter to a half a cup per day. Now, normally with flax recommendations, you start with a teaspoon, a couple teaspoons, maybe up to a tablespoon a day, because it can really jumpstart that, that digestion, that fiber that it acts like a broom, right? In the digestive system and helps you go and have regular bowel movements. But for certain things, we use a very large amount. So what are some of your top ways or some unique ways to get flax into your everyday living or everyday consumption, um, that you have found? Yeah. So you mentioned one of them already, um, using it in place of eggs. That's a common one. Using it in other bakery products to replace fat is another really easy way to get it in. Brownies or muffins. I, I use it in making pancakes. I, I don't add any oil at all to pancakes. I just use flaxseed and the ratio is three to one. So for example, if your recipe called for one tablespoon of oil, you could use three tablespoons of flax and you may want to increase your water depending on what the recipe is. But that's a very, very common one is to use it in your baking. And that's been done for quite a while. Um, And if you're not a baker, of, of course, you know, there's other ways you can add it. But our, we've, we've done a lot of recipe development. Um, So we have quite a few different recipes on Instagram um, everything from like peppermint macaroons to, well, overnight oats is probably one that people are also co- somewhat familiar with. But it, it really, truly can be added into almost anything. Um, we put it in soup as well. We'll dump it in soup and, and it really blends in extremely well. You can put it in sauces and it acts also as a thickener. So one of the properties of flaxseed is that it holds up to eight times its weight in water. So it will thicken um, sauces or soups. I haven't tried it in gravy, but I've, I've heard of others that have. Um, there's really limitless ways you can use it. Um, and I, for myself, I do something pretty boring. I just dump it in yogurt, but that works for me in, in the morning. I dump, I actually have about three and a half tablespoons a day in my yogurt. And I can certainly no- notice it's there, but it's very, very palatable. And I, I just, you know, that that's what works for me. So many people put it in smoothies as well. It, it blends right in and you'll never even know it's there. So we've got a lot of recipes on our Instagram and Pinterest and our website blog that you might be surprised when you kind of scroll through some of them, what you can put it in. But it really, truly is limitless. Cool. I'm actually looking right now and I am seeing graham crackers, donuts. I am seeing a lot of overnight oats. I am seeing apple crisp crumble. You had mentioned people putting it in coffee. I've never tried that either. Um, that's kind of like a, a different way to think about it. And I am seeing a cute idea. We are, by the time people are listening to this, it is right after Christmas. But if you're like me, you're probably still giving away some late Christmas gifts. And I see a really cute, um, I easy idea where it's a little Mason jar where people have made some overnight oats and added in some flax and things as a gift, kind of like a baking in a jar, but more of like an overnight oats in a jar. And I thought that was really kind of sweet. Mary, uh, what is the website? Is it manitobamilling.com? It is exactly. Yep. Cool. And the Instagram page is Manitoba Milling over at Instagram as well. Mary, thanks yeah. for coming on and talking to us a little bit about flaxseed and correcting, uh, correcting me when I'm wrong about oxidation and, and other, <laughs> other flaxseed yeah. discussion. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope we can connect, uh, connect again. One of the best gifts you could give us at The Less Stress Life is your feedback. We are paid in podcast reviews. If you enjoyed this or any other episode, please leave us a review. In the iTunes store or from your podcast app, just search for Less Stress Life as if you're not already subscribed. Click on the banana face image, scroll to the bottom where it shows the text of other reviews, and write a review. While you're there, hey, make sure you hit subscribe. For Android or Stitcher users, you gotta go to the desktop site and search for Less Stress Life, and then scroll down to leave a review. Stitcher doesn't load Apple reviews on their site, so if you want, you can leave 
leave a review in both places. Your feedback means a lot to the success of the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to do that. You rock.